to harness the benefits of trade agreements while trying to avoid the unnecessary limits on state regulatory authority and, and economic development policy choices that, unfortunately, some of the current agreements do, do pose. So with that, and again, thanks for including me, I'll start, if I may, with the GAP Antigua case. Just to give a brief background first, the current controversy rises out of a challenge against U.S. federal and state gambling regulations that was tabled by Antigua, and the original case sought to uh, obtain a WTO ruling that a vast array of federal and state laws violated U.S. WTO commitments under agreement called the General Agreement on Trade and Services, GATS, with an S, which is an agreement that sets rules for how foreign service firms uh, can provide their services in all forms of delivery, including across phones or internet, across borders, but also physical presence of foreign firms operating within the United States. And particularly, the, the GATS rules that are called the market access rules, found in Article 16 of the GATS, explicitly forbid governments from applying certain kinds of policies, even if they're applied equally to domestic and foreign service sector firms. And among those, those rules includes a ban on limiting the number of such firms. And the way the GATS works, because it was so remarkably controversial amongst most countries to have any kinds of service sector regulatory limits in a trade agreement back when the WTO was being negotiated in the late 80s and early 90s, that unlike many trade agreements like NAFTA, where we had a lot more power to dictate the terms, in WTO and GATS, those constraints only apply to the service sectors that countries submit to be bound to the agreement's rules. So each country has what's called a schedule of commitments. And when it came to the U.S., who is the main pusher of this agreement, we made a very long, detailed set of commitments. We subjected many aspects of the U.S. service sector economy to comply with these WTO rules. We subjected a lot of financial services, including to a variety of deregulatory terms, something we're going to have to fix to re-regulate in financial services. It's going to require changes to those WTO rules. We subjected health insurance, pharmaceutical distribution, many things one would argue wouldn't be appropriate to subject to top-down international constraints. What we thought we didn't submit was gambling. But the way the WTO works is all countries are required, quote, to ensure conformity of all laws, regulations, and domestic procedures to the attached WTO agreements. And one country can challenge another country's failure to do that before international tribunals are set up at the WTO. And so Antigua argued that the U.S. had committed, had bound the U.S. gambling sector to meet these WTO regulatory constraints. And they went to a WTO tribunal and started a case. And in fact, the tribunal ruled now five, almost five years ago, that initially, that the United States had bound gambling. Now, the United States government said, oh, no, we didn't. But what ended up happening is that the way in which these commitments are made, the scheduling is through a variety of different coded um, subcategories. And basically, what ended up happening is the WTO tribunal decided that because the U.S. had listed as committed a category called other entertainment services, recreation services, the way that a certain U.N. chart of those commitments and categories was listed, that included gambling. So the WTO dri tribunal wrote in a U.S. gambling commitment, and despite all the U.S. protests that they had no such intention, there's no outside appeal at WTO. So the U.S. went to the internal appeal system, the internal so-called appellate body of the WTO, agreed with the lower tribunal and said, nope, you listed that category. You may not have intended it. You should have been more careful. But that includes gambling. Gambling's in. So what, what ended up happening is because of technical errors in the filing of the case, the 
state law challenges were thrown out. But the tribunal ruled that, in fact, the U.S. Was, had bound all of gambling, and that explicitly and specifically the U.S. ban on Internet gambling was a violation of those market access rules. The panel ruled that a ban was the same thing as a quota of zero and therefore was forbidden. That has huge implications because we ban all kinds of pernicious activities. We do it on a non-discriminatory basis, and state and federal legislatures should be allowed to do that. But under this WTO rule, and we were told we had to get rid of the ban on Internet gambling, it was a technical ruling. What it basically said is if we could, we could have an exception to the WTO that related to morals apply to the case, if we change the law so that it also forbid interstate off-track horse race gambling. Well, the U.S. government, then the Bush administration, still didn't think that the case had been ruled correctly, and Congress wasn't willing to change that law. And in the end, Antigua went back to the WTO, and the WTO issued uh, a damages award. Under WTO, if you don't change your law within a certain amount of time, the WTO authorizes the other countries to apply trade sanctions against you indefinitely until you change the law. And so Antigua walked away with a trade damages ruling that would have allowed it to, to impose hundreds of millions of dollars of sanctions, at which point the Bush administration did something unique, which under the WTO, once a sector is bound, you can remove it. But unfortunately, under the rules, you can only remove it if you give notice and then offer to compensate any country that comes forward and says it would be damaged by future losses of opportunities by taking that sector out of the WTO. So the U.S. gave notice, this was the first time a country had used that rule, and to withdraw the gambling sector, and then other countries lined up to get compensation. And so the question, now to cut to where we are, um, the question has to do with the compensation deal that the U.S. made with the European Union. There were six countries that came forward for compensation, and the U.S. has allegedly completed negotiations with all the countries except Antigua. So under WTO rules, these compensation deals aren't adopted until they're all agreed, which is a blessing for us because the U.S. made these compensation negotiations in secret, and the documents would, the, the Bush administration refused to release the documents. And we ultimately used the Freedom of Information Act to try and demand the release of these documents, given a question would be changing what the U.S. commitments were. And we heard through the press, through leaks, that the Bush administration was going to commit new service sectors to comply with GATT in exchange for taking out gambling to compensate the countries who, who lined up for compensation. And so it's very important, because depending on what they're going to agree to bind, we could find ourselves in worse troubles and even the gambling situation in another case down the road and new constraints on policy. Well, we, we used the whole FOIA process and they weren't budging, so we sued them. And ultimately, they gave us the documents. And uh, what we found, now we only got the EU settlement document because that was the one that we knew for sure had actually been initialed. And so we went after that. So they wouldn't have an excuse if the documents aren't complete. Um, other, other entities, other countries, Hong Kong, the European Union, uh, Dominican Republic, a variety of other countries have, Japan has sued for compensation. And the EU document was really quite startling in that there were four new sectors of the U.S. service economy that were to be submitted to WTO. A couple of them didn't seem that controversial. There was something in postage and delivery that after we checked with the U.S. Postal Service and the postal unions seemed like it was basically something that had already happened and was just formalizing it. There was, a, and so that was, that was a, a commitment in Postal Express International Delivery Services. There was a research and development commitment that gave us great troubles, and we're still kind of worried about it, which has to do with subsidies for research and development, like, for instance, the research and development tax credit that President Obama's budget would make permanent. Um, we are in a tussle still with USTR about what that means, but we're fairly convinced that the way they wrote it probably still preserves the ability for the federal government to make sure those kinds of tax credits get used in the U.S. Not 100% certain, but we're not really worried about that one. There was another one that had to 
do with um, testing services that we think with a footnote change can be, with, with a footnote that was on is probably okay. I'm but sorry, the Lord, big Lord. glaring horror show in that thing was a commitment to storage and warehousing. Now that sounds kind of boring, except as we looked into what exactly in this crazy system of classifications, the very system that got the U.S. into the gambling problem in the first place was covered, we realized that liquid natural gas facilities and the huge storage facilities for both the liquid natural gas that's on the boats and then the regasified gas that's on shore were covered under this commitment. 